And I said, hey, I ended up getting prescribed Ozempic. And she looked at me and she just said, ooh, don't take it. As I start this video, I'm realizing that there's a recurring theme in the last few episodes of Dr. Chris in the videos on vaping, ADHD medication, and trend. This immediate gratification mentality that is very prevalent in our modern society, our craving for a quick fix, is fueling our consumption of either prescription or non-prescription drugs. The one we'll be discussing today exemplifies this very clearly, Ozempic. It seems like everyone is talking about Ozempic. It's become the hot new thing. So much so that even Hollywood is in on it. Everybody looks so great. When I look around this room, I can't help but wonder, is Ozempic right for me? Why? because of its drastic weight loss effects. I could say side effects, because technically it wasn't designed for weight loss, but weight loss, weight loss, easy weight loss, miracle diet drug, miracle weight loss drug. Does it work? Yes, it does work. This is a profound appetite suppressant. Flat out, that's what it's being used for. Ozempic is an injectable prescription medication intended to treat type 2 diabetes. It was the first of its kind and has been relatively successful in its treatment of diabetes. Soon after the initial rollout, however, patients began realizing that along with lowering blood sugar levels, they were shedding pounds without any effort. Though it is meant to be used alongside diet and exercise, because of how it works, that is to say primarily as an appetite suppressant, it doesn't actually require patients to do much to lose weight. Obviously, news of this <laughs> spread fast. People have been looking for an effective weight loss medication for at least the last century, so this was big. Ha <laughs> ha! Obesity is on the rise, alongside our increasingly high processed, high fat diets and sedentary lifestyles, especially in Western cultures. From 1990 to 2022, Obesity in adolescents increased from 2 to 8%, and obesity in adults from 7 to 16%. Those are global statistics. In the United States, however, as of today, more than 1 in 3 men and 1 in 4 women are overweight. More than 2 in 5 are obese. About 42% of American adults are obese, according to the CDC. So you can see how these numbers are significantly higher than the global average and how our lifestyle, one where everything is convenient and everything is done in excess, is starting to catch up with us. In our modern world, some people consider, again, mainly in the Western cultures, obesity a disease, a national epidemic. However, whatever your thoughts are on that, we can all acknowledge how challenging it may seem to some who are overweight, who want to lose weight to actually do so. Many factors contribute to this, from individual habits, to biology, to genetics, to even environmental and societal influence. So if someone who feels like they're at the mercy of their weight can get a little boost so that they can gain momentum on their health journey, then what's the harm? Or is taking medication like Ozempic just putting a band-aid on a societal issue that cuts more deeper? And if people are getting sick from what they are consuming, who is profiting from it? Today we will discuss what Ozempic is and why it's so popular. So let's get to it. I could drink a two liter a day. So two liters a day of Mountain Dew is how many calories, do you know? No idea, I never had to think about it. So Ozempic, as I mentioned, is prescription medication that you take once weekly by injection for type two diabetes. As stated on the Ozempic site, along with diet and exercise, it lowers blood sugar in adults with type 2 diabetes. The sites claim that a majority of adults taking Ozempic reached an A1C under 7% and maintained it. This refers to A1C hemoglobin, or simply blood sugar levels that are measurable by blood test. Normal levels are under 5.7% normal levels, whereas 6% and up is entering diabetes territory, with 9% being dangerously high. Ozempic is also meant to reduce the risk of major cardiovascular events such as heart attack, stroke, or death in adults with type 2 diabetes with known heart disease. In a 2021 study published in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology Journal, 17,000 patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, regardless of their diabetes status, had experienced a 20% reduction in symptoms after being given this type of drug. So now by this point, I am down the Ozempic rabbit hole. I'm watching all of these women's fat cells just melt away. So 
For diabetes and associated health problems, it does seem to work well. However, also advertised on the site are its amazing weight loss properties. <laughs> it says, adults with type 2 diabetes taking Ozempic lost up to 14 pounds, while in the same sentence maintaining that it's not a weight loss drug. But obviously, with diabetes, weight isn't an irrelevant factor. No, not everyone with type 2 diabetes is considered obese, but they are closely linked and one of the leading recommendations for managing diabetes is weight loss because it can help blood sugar management. So, of course, it is likely that effectively treating diabetes will address any weight issues as well. To understand why weight is affected, let's unpack what it actually is. Ozempic is semaglutide. Semaglutide belongs to a class of medications known as glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1, receptor agonists. This is the sequence of amino acids that make it up. This is semaglutide. It's made to mimic GLP-1. We have various hormones that aid in digestion. The GLP-1 hormone is one of these hormones that is released in the gastrointestinal tract in response to eating. In particular, it is the hormone that helps us feel full. However, it's not just about appetite suppression. There are receptors for GLP-1 in cells all throughout the body that serve different functions when triggered by the hormone. One role of GLP-1 is to promote the body, particularly the pancreas, to increase insulin production, which in turn reduces blood sugar. It also simultaneously decreases glucagon production, glucagon being another hormone that would otherwise naturally raise blood sugar levels. This dual effect is helpful for people with type 2 diabetes who are insulin resistant and produce little of their own. Obviously, synthetic insulin is a critical treatment for blood sugar management. Semaglutide makes the insulin you do have, whether it's produced naturally or synthetically, work better in your body. So that's how the hormone works to regulate blood sugar levels. But what does GLP-1 have to do with weight management? It is all about how it works in the stomach and in the brain. In the stomach, it slows gastric emptying, meaning you stay full for longer. It's kind of like what people suggest for dieting, you eat oatmeal in the morning because it leaves you fuller longer, but it's like that with basically anything that you eat. The stomach action works in combination with another crucial function. In the brain, particularly in the hypothalamus, GLP-1 works to suppress hunger cravings. It reduces appetite, signaling the feeling of fullness. GLP-1-based medications, such as semaglutide, are meant to amplify the effects of this hormone. I'm so <laughs> As explained by Dr. Janice Jin Huang in a New York Times article on Ozempic, people feel fuller faster. Foods that used to be really exciting to them are no longer exciting. Some reports their food noise or ruminations about food disappear after taking drugs like Ozempic. And because a lot of overeating that leads to obesity is psychological, this drug may be an effective way of healing someone's unhealthy relationship with food. Many people report their cravings actually changing. The junk food no longer appeal to them. Um, I'm one of those people who didn't find weight loss in Ozempic, but I did see it helping me see food a different way. If someone can break the pattern of either one, eating too much, or two, choosing the unhealthy option when they are hungry, if it can give them that breathing room to make a healthy decision, then it may be worth trying. And I started the medication and to start it was great. My sugars were controlled. It was easier to make better decisions and to not binge eat the way that I did. Ozempic comes in a few different strengths. 0.5 milligrams, one milligram, and two milligrams. And like any medication, it's important to find the ideal dosage for the particular patient. As Dr. Mike explains, when doctors prescribe, they do so with a titration mindset. Start low and they slowly increase your dose while monitoring how much weight you're losing, how many side effects you're experiencing. It's always about finding the minimal effective dosage for the desired results and tailoring the medication 
medication to the individual's needs. Unlike some of the other drugs we've discussed recently, this isn't so much to avoid overdose as it is to mitigate side effects. Some of the most common ones are gastrointestinal issues, such as nausea and vomiting. One in four people who take these medications will experience some form of nausea or stomach issues. Some weeks I can vomit up to 200 times. It's important to mention that the nausea people feel on Ozempic is similar to the nausea one may feel post gastric bypass surgery. That's how it works. You throw up constantly because the surgery forces you to when you overeat now. Other side effects that make sense when changes to your digestion are involved include diarrhea and constipation. Side effects in the form of diarrhea. Look away! Some also report intestinal blockage and abdominal pain. Intestinal blockage is exactly what it sounds like. It's when something blocks your intestine. You don't say! But to be honest, they don't stop there. Some of the other effects include vision changes, pancreatitis, severely low blood sugars when used with other diabetes treatments, kidney problems such as kidney failure, gallbladder problems, severe allergic reactions, and thyroid tumors, including cancer in rare cases. It can also cause malnutrition because you don't necessarily have to be super thin to be lacking in certain nutrients. So any major side effects that we're dealing with right now? Yeah, so this new one that I'm dealing with is hair loss, and I'm not mm. sure if it's related to like loss of nutrients or the ozempic or just like it's a very stressful time. Another side effect is an aesthetic one, ozempic face. Yes, that is a thing. People report experiencing a hollowed look to the face, sagging jowls, sunken eyes, and wrinkles following their rapid weight loss. So while you may lose weight, you could possibly gain what appears to be years in age. And some people have gone so far to claim that taking Ozempic and losing weight from it has made their face look like it's actually melting. You lose the subcutaneous fat that's present in your skin, especially if in your 30s or 40s. On a side note, Another interesting, not so much side effect, but risk factor to be aware of is how drugs that delay gastric emptying like Ozempic can present problems for surgical patients. As a surgeon, a surgeon, we normally require patients to fast before surgery to ensure there is no food in their system. If we have to intubate a patient, sometimes people's gag reflex is stimulated when the breathing tube is put in and they may aspirate or throw up. If they throw up, it may go down their windpipe and cause a chemical pneumonitis or basically burning the tissues in your lungs, which can lead to pneumonia. For this reason, we require patients to stop taking it one full week prior to surgery. So there's absolutely no food in their system. So yeah, there's that too. Since people who are taking Ozempic are also in the same camp as many gastric bypass candidates, this is an important consideration. Ingesting so much as a single gummy bear, one of my personal favorite snacks on call, is enough to have a surgery canceled. So with many side effects, do the benefits outweigh, no pun intended, the risks? <laughs> there is substantial evidence that semaglutide does work in one way or another. I say semaglutide because most scientific studies that I'm going to mention are on just that, semaglutide, which if you recall is the active ingredient in Ozempic, but aren't necessarily on Ozempic itself. In another Lancet study funded by Novo Nordisk, which is actually the pharmaceutical company that makes Ozempic, approximately 1,000 participants were given once weekly semaglutide and found that this was more effective than once daily insulin in lowering blood sugar. My A1C went from 10% down to 7%. And that is a huge improvement in six months. So as you can see, there is real world evidence and clinical findings that suggest semaglutide can be effective for people with diabetes. Surprisingly, however, the focus of many of these studies is on weight and weight related issues because in terms of obesity, the results of semaglutide rival that of bariatric surgery. Although they are not quite as dramatic, for a non-invasive alternative, semaglutide shows major promise. One of the more notable studies was again funded by Novo Nordisk and presented at the annual meeting of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. This three-year study showed that body weight fell by 4.7 kilograms after the initiation of treatment with sustained reductions over three years. 
Historically, weight loss drugs have been associated with dangerous side effects and have been pulled from the market. Weight loss drugs have been around since ancient times, with herbs and natural remedies being used to induce weight loss. But they only really started getting popularized for obesity in the last century. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, commercial products such as laxatives were being advertised but had no scientific backing. Get us so kind to your system. According to the American Medical Association, the first generation of real weight loss drugs were developed between the 1930s and 60s. This was the era of the rainbow pills. These were stimulants such as dinitrophenol and methamphetamine and were only approved for short-term use for weight loss because being amphetamine based, people were worried about their addictive potential. As fellow medical YouTuber Dr. Karen points out, civilian use went through the roof and by 1970, <laughs> 5% of Americans were using some kind of prescription amphetamine. These came with major risks and were later banned. But it shows how serious people were about finding an effective weight loss medication. Keep in mind that it was around this time, post-World War II, with the rise of suburbia, interstate highways, and other car forward infrastructure that the fast forward industry really began to ramp up as well. The drive through model brought a new level of convenience for people seeking a quick bite. This nine layer gastronomic indulgence is known as a Big Mac. As stated in Eric Scholar's book, Fast Food Nation, the fast food industry has abused our nation, not in a painful way, but in a harmful way. drive throughs were essentially developed to make fast food even faster. About 60 to 70% of a restaurant's sales come from the drive through We will return to this topic, American diet trends, very soon. For now, just understand that the rise of the weight loss drugs obviously grew out of a demand for them. That is to say, <laughs> the rise in obesity. In the decades to follow, with scientists gaining a better understanding of obesity and food intake regulation, a second generation of weight loss medications were developed. These targeted the central regions of the brain as well as the digestive system. Drugs like Fenfen were used, but later withdrawn due to, again, safety risks. In 1999, Orlistat was approved by the FDA, which is an oral medication that blocks fat absorption in the intestines. That was all that was available for a while. It was only actually in the 2010s when clinical studies involving GLP-1 receptor agonists like semaglutide began. These were conducted initially for the treatment of diabetes and blood sugar management, but showed promising results for weight loss in the process. It's great, it's not why I'm taking it, but my diabetes is very well under control under Ozempic. Shortly after, in 2017, Nova Nordisk, a Danish multinational pharmaceutical company, developed Ozempic. Ozempic being a drug with relatively low side effects compared to some of the other weight loss drug attempts boomed. Obviously, people got word of its effectiveness for not only diabetics and hopped on board the Ozempic train. Woo -woo! As of today, the hashtag Hashtag Ozempic has 1.4 billion TikTok views. Influencers and celebrities are talking about it. The whole town is on Ozempic. My doctor had given it to me a while ago and said, oh, if you ever want to lose a couple pounds in a week. Celebrities like Kim Kardashian and Elon Musk have been dosing themselves with Ozempic. The world responds to me a lot more favorably when I am thin. I mean, with the lens always pointed at you and people always criticizing your appearance, I'm sure a lot of celebrities feel the pressure to stay fit and camera ready 24 seven. Shut up, the camera adds 10 pounds. Uh, so how many cameras are actually on you? <laughs> However, with social media, it's not only celebrities who feel that pressure. For now, all you need to understand is that social media and the selfie era has made us hyper aware of how we look. Because of this, it makes sense that people who are overweight may want or feel like they need to slim down and to do it fast, like, like yesterday. And that becomes difficult when the society you live in seems to reinforce unhealthy habits. The internet has also contributed to a change in our perception of weight and weight related issues in another way, because the American diet has actually been shifting since the turn of the century. The latter half of the 1900s brought the rise of popular diet trends, such as Atkins, Mediterranean, Keto, Paleo, etc. However, it was in the 2000s, as we entered the digital age, that dieting really became mainstream. 
As this Vice article points out, it was the era of Paris Hilton and Nicole Ricci, of nothing tastes as good as skinny feels and models with thigh gaps. As they call it, a cult of thinness. All of these factors were only fueled with the introduction of social media. Because of the pressure to look a certain way online and people becoming increasingly health conscious, it's understandable why people with obesity did and still can feel overwhelmed. It may feel like society set them up for weight related issues with the type of food being sold and a general unawareness of what being healthy entails. And now they are looking to these societal institutions to fix it. So when a drug like Ozempic comes on the market, it's no wonder why people with obesity or even just people who are overweight or even just people who are wanting to slim down were rushing straight to it. There was literally a run to doctors to prescribe this medication for them off label in order to help them with their weight loss. Regardless of the fact that this is a prescription medication, many people were able to get it off label. Prescribing a drug off label, meaning not for its intended use, is considered part of the practice of medicine and is up to the doctor's discretion. If they think that it would work well to deal with the patient's symptomatology, then they have the right to do that. Up to 38% of all prescriptions written in the US are off label. And yes, as a doctor, I can say that we do our best at remaining unbiased and uninfluenced when making the decision to prescribe medication. But it is very likely that many people who take Ozempic have no medical reason to take it. A situation like this may cause the public to raise their eyebrows. I've lost 10 pounds in a month. Think I've worked out? I have not worked, I haven't done shit. You think I've eaten any better? No. It's also not ideal for the drug company because even though they are making money from whoever buys it, I mean, a customer is a customer. If off-label usage gets out of hand, then it could mean unfavorable publicity for them. So what was Novo Nordisk's solution? Make a new drug with the same basic idea. A semaglutide injection taken once weekly. Only this one is slightly stronger. And as soon as I switched to the concentrated formula, the diarrhea came back full force with a vengeance. This new drug named Wagovi, which was approved by the FDA in 2021, is specifically for obesity. The messaging started to center more around weight loss than it did diabetes. Now the drug company making bank off Ozempic could start selling their products outright to the real clients, people who wanted to lose weight. As stated in a Forbes article, investor excitement from the Ozempic craze caused Nova Nordisk's market capitalization to balloon from 230 billion, billion with a B, bro, in October 2022 to over 530 billion today. Remarkably, the firm's market value is now larger than its home country of Denmark's entire annual economic output. We're rich, we can retire. That's right. Nova Nordisk is now Europe's largest public company. So it seems like Ozempic and Wagovi are doing quite well as a purchasable product, which is great news for the pharmaceutical company. However, that money has to come from somewhere. And for consumers, it can be quite pricey. As pointed out in this New York Times article, Ozempic can cost around $892 for a monthly supply without insurance. And people who don't meet the FDA's criteria will likely have trouble getting insurance to cover it. I think the downside, as we all know, is that Ozempic is so expensive. My retail price of Ozempic is like $900 and I don't pay $900, I have insurance, but it's so far out of reach for so many people because it's so expensive. But what is the FDA's criteria for obesity? Technically, to be considered eligible for a Wagovi prescription, you have to be obese or have excess weight with at least one weight-related condition. To determine obesity, the FDA uses BMI, or the Body Mass Index. This metric is what we've traditionally used, though it is still widely debated. That said, it's difficult to classify obesity. To determine what a normal body weight is or should be, especially in the modern world where political correctness, cancel culture, and fat shaming are big topics of discussion. It's a touchy subject. According to the FDA and the World Health Organization, a BMI of 25 or more is considered overweight, whereas 30 plus is obese. However, having an effective and relatively safe weight loss drug is quite significant. 
As stated in this medical review, it helps to change societal views on obesity, recognizing it as a chronic disease rather than solely as a result of lifestyle choices. While it's definitely valid that these drugs can help people who are obese gain control of their eating habits, is obesity really a disease? There have been discussions about it being a significant health problem since the 80s, but it was only officially declared a disease by the American Medical Association in 2013, and this claim is still debatable by the medical community and society at large, even today. By the mid-19th century, being excessively overweight, or obese, was recognized as a cause of ill health. We have to remember that the pharmaceutical industry is a business. Novo Nordisk spent big money on meals and travels in 2022, whining and dining doctors to promote their medications. A big price tag even for Big Pharma, more than $11 million on wooing prescribers to promote popular weight loss drugs like Ozempic. Go like that, press. That's it. That's it. She was paid nearly $10,000 by Novo Nordisk. So some doctors, who are pushing obesity as a narrative have actually been not necessarily bought, but definitely influenced by the drug companies themselves. This doctor, for example, is a weight management specialist who consults for none other than Novo Nordisk. The biggest misconception about weight and obesity is that somehow your weight is under your control. That's not all doctors. Not everyone is swayed by potential financial benefit. But I do want you to be aware that it is a reality within the medical community and our capitalistic society in general. Whatever your views on the matter, it's clear that obesity is multifactorial and is very challenging for those dealing with it. It is also clear that medications being used to treat obesity are being used by more than just those who meet the medical requirements. A person's need for the drug is very subjective. Everybody who's reaching out to me on this topic, virtually none of these are people with type 2 diabetes. These are people that are asking the question solely through the lens of weight loss. Perhaps more disturbing to me is the people who are reaching out to me who are frankly not overweight remotely, but are saying like, I really wanna lose 10 pounds to look good on my vacation. As I mentioned, all this off-label prescribing is starting to be problematic. Novo Nordisk literally can't keep up with the demand for their drugs. In 2022, both Ozempic and Wagovi were put on the FDA's drug shortage list, and what was expected to last until late 2023 is still persisting today. Demand is now leading to widespread shortages. Ozempic stock, at least in our stores, are completely out of stock right now. When there are drug shortages, companies can make and sell compounded versions, given they meet certain FDA requirements. However, these products may not actually have the same active ingredient, even though they can still be marketed as the same thing. They also may not have been tested to ensure their safety and efficacy. So the drug shortage can affect the quality of the products, even if you do manage to get your hands on some. Not to mention how the shortage can affect actual diabetics, for whom the drug was initially intended. If they're taking it for weight loss and then deciding, well, maybe this isn't for me, you're actually taking it from people who are using it for its intended use. Nevertheless, Nova Nordis is on the case. As stated on their website, in 2024, they are going to, once again, significantly step up their investments in production by almost double this time, going from 3.6 billion in production last year to 6.5 billion this year. And as much as these products market that their drugs are meant to be taken with diet and exercise, realistically, many people take them without adjusting their lifestyle whatsoever. I've done sh This is my major concern for drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi. The people are just doing this as a band-aid without actually addressing the root cause of their obesity. Ideally, someone who takes this medication uses it temporarily to get a better handle on their eating habits and to encourage them to either start or keep exercising. By helping them see that positive change is possible, that losing weight is doable, they are meant to be motivated to prioritize their health in all areas of their life. And if you are currently taking Ozempic responsibly, great. This just reiterates what you already know. However, guess what when they stopped? It all came back, including their hypertension and their diabetes. Only lasts for as long as you take it. Exactly. It's kind of a big thing. Like exactly. once you stop, you could gain more. even more. One study performed by John P. H. Wilding et al. noted what happened to the 327 patients one year after stopping weekly semaglutide treatments. On average, 
The patients gained back two thirds of the weight, concluding that the lost weight was likely to return on these medications. However, another much larger study conducted by Kirsten Bartlett et al, this one with 40,000 patients either taking semaglutide or liraglutide, which is a similar drug, showed that the majority of their patients, 56%, managed to maintain the same weight as when they stopped taking the medication or even lose more. In this study, one fifth of the people regained all of the weight some of which put on even more. Once these people get off Ozempic, their guts aren't producing as much GLP-1 on its own anymore. However, with conflicting results, I think it really just comes down to you as a person and by ripple effect, the society you're living in. People are trying to make money. So while you're getting sick, in this case, obese from the unhealthy food you're choosing to eat, then taking medication to deal with your now sickness, both the food production industry and the pharmaceutical companies are profiting off you. So if we expect our society to be healthy and offer us healthy choices, we as the individuals who make up the society need to value our health. This goes for everyone because this goes with all health issues, not just obesity. We need to stand up for ourselves to ourselves and demand that we do the best that we can to make our lifestyle as healthy as possible and do our part where we can to make healthy lifestyle choices when engaging with our environment. Whether you take the drug or not, a healthy diet and regular exercise is essential for a good quality lifestyle. Period. That said, it's important that we look at our relationship with food because so often it is reduced to calories. When we talk about dieting, we become hyper-focused on a caloric deficit, but food is more than quantity. It's also about quality. As Dr. Karen points out, many clinicians are not adequately trained on nutrition. There's an overwhelming focus on appetite suppression, which distracts us from our food environment. Doctors prescribing these medications need to consider the patient's current lifestyle and stress the importance of what will be required from them for treatment to be effective. Because treatment means healing, as in the goal is to be healed, as in no longer needing healing. But if the weight comes back when you stop taking the medication, was it even effective? It's not about becoming dependent on a drug to keep you thin and the mindset that led to the issue, that is to say immediate gratification never being addressed. Active rehabilitation is as it sounds, taking an active role in your rehabilitation process. In this case, that would mean yes, physical activity and healthy food choices. But let's say you were doing those things and you're still not losing weight, which is why a lot of people turn to weight loss medication. Virtually every fat person that I know or that I've taken care of, they are not disproportionately eating more than their peers. In some cases, yes. One important factor to discuss is the hormonal aspect of weight management. Your hormonal balance can directly affect your ability to lose weight. An imbalance in hormones can also cause an increased appetite, slower metabolism, and elicit your body's stress response. That is to say, increase cortisol to store fat. Therefore, if you want to affect your weight, you also need to get your hormones in check. There are many things that can contribute to hormonal imbalance, most of which are related to what we've been discussing. These include things like not moving enough or lack of exercise and processed foods. Again, reiterating the importance of physical activity and healthy food choices. There are also some other factors that may not be as obvious. This includes eating at odd times. Your body and your digestive system have a natural rhythm that is synced with the daylight, energy levels, and your sleep cycle. So it's also important when you eat. Furthermore, a hormonal imbalance can also be caused by stress. This one is freaking huge. If you're living in survival mode, constantly in a state of stress and paranoia, then it signals to your body to almost hoard fat. The problem is everything in our modern world is absolutely ravaging our hormones. In a nutshell, if we don't actively think about our health, it's easy for heaviness, both physically and mentally, to feel like our reality. We need to be intentional about everything we consume, from media to products to food. It's important to ask ourselves, what do we actually want in our life? We have to care about our own health, or companies can and will profit off our indifference. Once you get someone on Ozempic or Wegovi, you're set. They're dependent. And now you have a customer for life. Therefore, Ozempic is not a cure-all. The only thing that is, is you valuing your health so much that it cannot be exploited. No more stuffing your face with cookies and cake and Doritos. Your body is a temple. 
As an obesity medication, Ozempic can definitely help people get back on track with their weight. However, it's important that prescription comes alongside education. People need actual strategy on how to live healthily, and even more so, people need to understand how all areas of your life are interconnected and directly impact each other. Oh my God, have you been left here? Have you been abandoned? What, who would do this? This doesn't mean you're not loved. This can allow us to look at a seemingly isolated issue, that is to say weight, from an expanded perspective, that is to say health in its entirety. Drug interventions are useful tools, but they need to be part of a person-centered approach that addresses root causes and other surrounding medical conditions. I will leave you with a point from nephrologist and author Dr. Jason Fung, who promotes the health benefits of fasting. The lesson it's teaching you about weight loss is that it's not about controlling the calories. It's about controlling your hunger. Why are you taking so many calories? Chew on that. Anyways, that's all for today, interns. For homework, take a moment to take care of your health mentally and physically. Make a healthy home-cooked meal. Add some nice flavors. And prove to yourself that healthy food can be delicious. Go for a simple walk and enjoy the fresh air. Remember, being active doesn't have to be grueling, just move. And if anything, just take a bath and relax. Still, your mind. I take a bath every day and I love it. It's very calming. And remember, if you're having surgery next week, please stop taking your Ozempic. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe and give it a big thumbs up to feed the algorithm. If you didn't like the video, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. I read as many comments as I can and we use your feedback to make our videos better for you. And of course, don't forget to follow my gym, Human 2.0 Fitness, for free right here on YouTube, where we post content that helps you move better and prevent injury. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.